Subway famous $5 footlongs. So many sublicious choices, like the delicioso spicy Italian. And when you enjoy any regular footlong, order one of the many Subway dollar footlong sidekicks, like 21 ounce drinks and tasty sides, just $1 each or less. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. You must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife. Cutting through a well-aged state. Now, now, now. Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. All right, here's part two of the three-man weave with ESPN's Rick Buecher and Mark Stein, both of whom called in on the Subway Fresh Take hotline. That's right, we have two hotlines when we have the three-man weave. Uh, we're going to cover the East playoffs and some beat writer stuff, and then Steiny Mo and I are going to talk a little bit about the future of the NBA. We want to say one thing. Some readers have asked why, or some listeners, I should say, why we split these up when they go long. And the reason is that um, a lot of people have trouble downloading the podcast if it goes over like 40, 45 minutes, especially if you do it on iPhone. So we just thought it would be easier to split things up. That way it's easier to download and so on and so forth. So there you go. Anyway, here's part two. Let's talk about the East really quick. Orlando really let me down the last couple of weeks. I was really expecting them to kind of make it a four-team race for the title, basically. And I thought they just kind of... They whiffed. And then now I'm not sold on them at all. I think it's a three-team race. Um, I think it's going to be Celtics, Cavs again. Am I wrong? Do you guys see anybody else uh, stepping in there? I felt Orlando was a mirage all year long. They're not, they're not as good defensively as their numbers say they are. They get teams into, the, into shooting a lot of quick open threes. Not because uh, they, they don't defend the three. They just leave you so wide open, you can't resist hoisting them up as quickly as as uh, as they do. And they're a little bit better at that, and they've got some odd matchups. But at the end of the day, I just I, I don't I, I've never liked I've never liked their team. They're they're in in a way they're as oddly matched as as the Utah Jazz are as far as being a a championship caliber team. There's just some pieces that are that are weird and. You know, everybody made a big deal about them getting Rafer. I don't believe that Rafer has had, at the end of the day, a positive impact on that team. Hmm. What do you think, Stanley Ma? Now, I've, you know, at various points have made the same Mirage con- comment, but every time I did, I had, you know, smarter people than me who saw it and kept telling me, you're wrong about this team. You know, people with other teams, people that didn't have a vested interest, I'm, you know, I'm telling you Orlando is good. They're better than you think. They're for real. So as the year went on, I did kind of buy into it. And, you, you know, they, they put up some pretty decent wins. Now, both the wins over Boston with Rafe are, are flawed because, I mean, they did everything they could to give the games away. And, you know, KG not out there. I mean, so those wins don't look as good as – look on good as – you know, they're not as good as they look on paper. But I did – believe in this team to a degree i mean and then just the smackdown they put on cleveland just a, you know a week and a half ago and then you know they it's like okay the season's over they haven't played you know they've been awful since i mean they did go into atlanta and win but they've been awful since then all right you, you guys know, sit the, down one hold on there oh. one of the things there is that Hito just consistently over the last few years has has not had anything left at the end of the year you and guys he's sitting a big down part of what they do you yeah. guys sitting down yes I think the Bulls are going to beat Orlando in round one. I'm throwing it out there, and I believe it. Based on? I like the way the Bulls are playing. I, I think you throw out the first four and a half months of the season, you look at the last six weeks, that team plays well together. They, they've, whatever, for whatever reason, some weird stuff, they made that, that trade with Sacramento that turned out to be a really good trade. Rose has I gotten you were better. Have them, I thought you were going to have them beating the Celtics. That, that, I would have sat down for that. No, that would have been good. Um, Jerry Reinsdorf, executive of the year for publicly calling his team a disaster <laughs> and then spurring them on to a... I just think yeah, the Bulls... Yeah, but you know what? He, get, he allowed them to make that expensive deal. To change yeah. the, I mean, the, the caveat, from what I understand, the, the, the mandate is that they have to get to the second round. I think the Bulls can do it. I really do. And I think... Uh, you look, you look at the way that they can score in multiple ways. All of a sudden, they have Ty Thomas playing well, Noah's playing well, 
And the X factor for me is Turkulu. And the fact that, yeah. you know, he really got hurt. He's going to be limping around in round one. Yep. And yep. that Magic team just isn't very deep, doesn't have a lot of options. And I'm not sold that Dwight Howard, you know, I know Buke feels the same way. Dwight Howard, to me, is just not the kind of guy I was like, hey, guys, get on my back. I'm going to carry us this round. He's not like that. He'll play not one good close. game and one bad one. I'll give you that. I mean, the guy, he can't score enough to be that guy. I mean, yeah. Well, they don't. And they don't. You know, the weird thing is, is that teams are going to take away what they live off of. I mean, literally, if they don't turn you over and they don't outshoot you from the three-point line, they can't win. And, right. and the teams that they are going to face in the postseason are not going to turn the ball over, and they're not going to rush their shots. You saw, you saw when they played Houston. That was, you know, Houston just played a disciplined, slow-down game, and now they've got to rely on, on Dwight doing everything on the inside, and his game is just is, is not there yet. And that's where, that's where I really uh, I depart. I mean, I, I, I ended up giving him my defensive player of the year uh, – uh, vote, but I did it so reluctantly because I'm convinced that we go by the rebounds and the block shots, and that's as much a function of that they're not good on the perimeter. It's a little bit like Ben Wallace getting all those defensive player of the year awards. Right. He's not, he was never good on the ball, and it, it was all, it's always been a stats-driven award, and you can't tell me that there aren't guys on the perimeter defensively. I mean, I had a couple players tell me this this is the year that LeBron James and Kobe Bryant should have been vying for Defensive Player of the Year, but because we think of them as MVPs, we'd never think of... Yeah, I think that's overblown. I, I, I mean, everybody's talking about Wade and Kobe and LeBron as Defensive Player of the Year candidates. I think we're exaggerating. There's no question they all are great defenders when they want to be, but are they playing every possession D? I mean, they can't. They, with, the, with the offensive responsibility they have, they can't do it, but... I would have voted for LeBron. That, uh, I'm not saying that they, they defend every possession, but what I've seen, particularly with Kobe, and this is this again, this is where there's a distinction between Wade and and Kobe and and LeBron. Kobe and LeBron at the end of games are taking the toughest defensive assignment, and they will take not only at the end of games but throughout the course of the game and, and important possessions, they will take that responsibility. Dwayne Wade is still an Allen Iverson type defender in that he's a gambler. He, I mean. It, it, I, what I want to see statistically, and we got to get we got to get Daryl to give this up. <laughs> I want to see a stat, not on number of steals, but steal percentage, where we track how many times does a guy go for the steal and doesn't get it and leaves his team exposed, and then compare that to the number of total steals that he gets. Because I guarantee you that Wade and Chris Paul will not fare quite as well if we kept track of that. It's a good point. I like it. Uh, I I would have voted for LeBron as defensive player of the year, not just because he was guarding the other team's best guy every game on it, for a team that won 65 games, but he had some defensive plays during the season, and especially yeah. in home games that, you know, got the crowd involved, turned the game around, shifted the momentum of the game. I thought, you know, he had like those Russell type of defensive plays, especially yep. coming from behind, blocking Chase guys. And, down. Yeah, I just thought you know, he had a bigger impact. And you know, got, I mean, you got to give him this. He guards one through four. I mean, there aren't a lot of guys who can do that. So you have and to, well, you have to give you know, him. You know, the, the the guy that I would love to put on my ballot, and I just don't know that I can. And actually, in in a, in another universe, I might even consider at the top of my ballot. And you guys are going to laugh because they're a terrible defensive team. Roni Turiaf has 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 had as good a defensive year as a as a player, both as a shot blocker and on the ball. Uh, consistently, game in and game out, game game uh, night in and night out, uh, as as any player I've seen in a in a long time. Now he's not going to get that credit, but that's what I'm talking about. Where we just you know we look at the guys who have the block shots and the rebounds or the steals or you know it's it's so much by reputation and not really looking at who's the guy who makes his bread and butter. Well, Battier is on my ballot, and I think Artest is the one who gets all the love there. Yeah, I would, I would agree. That's another, that's another example. Although I, you know, Battier and Bowen, it seems like there's a number of guys who this is, this is what's weird is there seems to be a little bit of a, a sea change going on here, where those, those, those perimeter defenders that we always thought of, the Cephalosias and the Batums and the, and the next uh, generation of those guys haven't quite arrived yet. 
And I think that's where I think that's where we are. I mean, I I canvassed the entire league looking for somebody else that I could genuinely look at as the defensive player of the year instead of Dwight Howard. And at the end of the day, I just I couldn't find anybody that was convincing enough. I mean, they're a top five defensive team now, whether you believe the stats or not. You got to acknowledge that it's not just the rebounds and blocks. I mean, they've he's look. I mean, his power forward is a scorer. I mean, Courtney Lee's their only other defender. I mean, I guess Jameer is a, is a better defender probably than his reputation suggests. But, I mean, he's got a lot to do defensively on that team. Let's not, let's not just talk. Totally oh, no, 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 no. I believe, I, no question he has a lot to do, but it's a little bit like, you know, Marcus Camby had a lot to do with Denver. But that was because, you know, Melo and AI weren't guarding anybody. So but Denver wasn't a top five team. Five De- Denver wasn't game. a top five team, though, last year. Hey, uh, the Chicago Bulls, 14-6 yeah. and six their last 20 games. They have home wins against New Orleans, Boston, Miami, and uh, Detroit, Charlotte. Not terrible. No, they've been good at home. Is Salmon's healthy enough, though? Yeah. I I, I have my eye on that series. Good. There's always one weird round one series, and I think that's it. So you guys agree Cavs and Boston and probably – Unless KG actually does come back, which all of us are dubious, it's looking like Cavs Lakers. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I have no reason to believe it's going to be anything other than Cavs Lakers. If you had to pick one team to upset the Cavs Lakers probable finals, what team would that be? The Celtics. It is for me. Yeah, by default. Mm. It is. I mean, but but that, almost, that's but, why I'm. It, that's it, why I'm down because the West. You know, again, we're going to have. You know, eight fifty win teams or at least seven. But I mean, it's like the first two rounds of the playoffs. You know, what what is gonna happen? What is gonna be meaningful in the first two rounds of the playoffs? Here's well, the my... good thing is is all that's gonna change next year. I think the bottom's gonna drop out of out of the Western Conference. Yeah. I think you'll be able to get in I think you'll be able to get into the playoffs next year with, with forty five wins. Here's my biggest fear with the Celtics, and it goes beyond the whole KG thing, because I actually do think they could beat the Cavs, as crazy as this sounds, in a series with an injured KG or KG at 6%. The fact that Pierce is the guy that has to guard LeBron, which is fine if you're doing it once, but to ask him to do that seven times over a 15-day span is – I went to – I was home for the the Sloan Conference that weekend. They played the Cavs on a Friday night – Pierce was amazing. This is one of his best games of the season. Did a really nice job of LeBron. They played Orlando 37 hours later, and he was terrible because he was so yeah. worn out from Friday night. I don't think he could. I don't think at age 31 he has the energy to stay with LeBron for seven games. It's too improbable. None of us are going to get invited back to the Sloan Conference because we all talk about Maury so much now. The guy used to be <laughs> under the radar, and now we're just throwing him out every third subject. I was proud well, of him, though. He stayed out of the Ron Artest Sports Illustrated story. We're going to be banned. Hey, uh, he, uh, I, I, if he hadn't been such a cut-up at the, uh, at the conference, he, <laughs> he might have stayed uh, under the radar, too. I mean, he was, he was Jeff Van Gundy-esque. He was. He at was that witty. conference. It was hey, unbelievable. Laker-Cavs finals. Who do you guys have? Steiny Mill, you go first. Uh, I'm thinking Lakers. Really? Yeah. I just think... They will have a significant, even though they don't have the home court advantage, I, I just see Cleveland having to expend a lot more energy to get there. And I even think, in, you know, the, the shell of themselves that the Pistons are, that's still not going to be a fun series for Cleveland, even in the first round. Whereas, you know, yeah, we all think maybe Portland can give the Lakers a push, but, you know, are, are the Lakers even going to see Portland the way things are shaping up? What do you think, Buke? I'm convinced that the Lakers were only worried about having home court advantage over Boston and that once they had that, no matter what they said, having it over Cleveland wasn't just that important because they're not intimidated by Cleveland at all. Hmm. And I, I, if they're healthy and if Bynum is there, I mean, I, I believe they need to have Bynum. Bynum changes everything because they're, he changes the dribble penetration. He can make things difficult. He can make a he can help make a jump shooter out of LeBron, and if you do that, uh, that makes Cleveland very very vulnerable. They better be and healthy. We we are owed a healthy finals after this season of nonstop injury nonsense. Here's the yep. thing that the biggest thing in Cleveland's favor, in my opinion, hmm. if they have home court, first of all, they've only lost once there all year. I think yes, the Lakers could beat them once, but here's the thing: 
the way with this ridiculously stupid two three two setup. It is so hard to win for the home team to win those three middle games. You figure yeah. Cleveland will win one. There's gonna be one game where LeBron shoots twenty seven free throws and whatever, they get out of it, they escape. So that means the Lakers have to actually win two games in Cleveland to win the series. That's a little dicier. You know what I'm so saying? So much of this is, yeah, so much of this is going to, I, I mean, we're going to find out a lot more as these teams go through the playoffs because as good as Cleveland has been during the regular season, they still have some guys, and Mo Williams in particular, that they're going to have to count on in the postseason that, uh, if you look at Mo's track record, now granted it was with Milwaukee, but there are some guys who who are not the same player in the postseason when it matters. Yeah. Uh, that the looseness that they play with disappears, and when they have to tighten up a little bit, their game changes. And I, that's I'm not saying that he can't. I just there are more. I have more questions at this point about how some of the Cleveland's key players are going to respond with a a, a ring right in front of their faces than I do with, with the Lakers. We've seen, we've seen that. We're also assuming here that that home court invincibility lasts all the way to the finals. What happens if Detroit steals a game? Or you know, certainly the Celtics right. are capable of winning there. I mean, you know, then maybe we view that home court differently by the time we get well, that far. I, I, think, I think they will view it differently. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the huge risk of being, you know, 40, 41 and one, or 40 and one at home, is that now you go to the playoffs and you lose that first playoff game at home. It's it it almost it's almost worse because you thought you were invincible and now suddenly you're not. You know, I did I did notice when I was working on my book there is a phenomenon. You know, you you see you go through history and you see that a team makes the leap where they go from you know we're we're really good to now we're the alpha dog. And you even saw it last year with the Celtics. You saw it with the 91 Bulls. You saw it with the 2000 Lakers with Shaq and Kobe. They, for whatever reason, the alpha dog, when they get to the playoffs, the new alpha dog, they yeah. struggle. Like the Lakers yep. like barely beat Portland. The Celtics yep. barely got through Atlanta and, uh, and Cleveland last year. The yep. Bulls, I can't remember who they struggled against. Oh, the, uh, it was the Knicks in 92. I, I basically count that was their new alpha dog season, 92. But, um, they struggle more than they, they kind of, as Buke said, they get a little complacent in their arrogance. Oh, yeah, we're 40 and 1 at home. And the bottom line is that stuff doesn't matter in the playoffs. You got to actually yep. come through. And that, that's what worries me about this Cleveland team is you don't want to be overconfident when you haven't done it before. Yep. You want to be overconfident. Not only that, but you're, now you're, you're supposed to win. And, yeah. it does you're, not, and, you're, and you're supposed to win decisively. I mean, so yeah. the first time that you get into a first quarter and you're down by five, it's like, holy cow, what's, what's going on? Yeah. I don't want to say this makes up for KG's injury because it doesn't, but I, I think we probably don't put enough weight on the Celtics know they can do it, and they're the only team in the running that knows it can do it. I mean, even I the Lakers have not, have not done it without Shaq. So well, I, yeah, I, 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 I give them some points for that. Biggest, yeah, I agree. biggest X factor – of the playoffs. I have a pick, but let's go with Stanley Mo. Biggest X factor. Biggest X factor. One player. Well, I would say Roy, because if we're gonna say that Portland has any chance to do anything, he's gonna have to be he's gonna have to be great. Or are you meaning like a surprise guy? No, somebody that not in the typical crew of guys that are mentioned that you think could swing the playoffs potential. Duke, you wanna you wanna throw one out? You got one. Uh, I would say, well, if it was Portland, I would say Lamarcus Aldridge before Roy. Yeah. I think I know what I'm gonna get out of Roy. See, for but me, this answer is obvious. I would say overall, Trevor Ariza. Oh, interesting. I would. I for me, it's Odom. I think if if Odom plays well, that team's unbeatable. And hmm. if he doesn't, they're not. But if he, like you know, for instance, that the ABC game in Cleveland when he just destroyed the Cavs. If they can get that four times a series from them, from him, yeah. nobody's going to beat them because the way Gasol has played this year, and that really Gasol has been the underrated story of. of well, do the they season. even need it four times, and maybe you only need it twice? Yeah, maybe two, three times, whatever. But 
when they have Odom running on all cylinders, they have three of the top 20 guys in the league, basically. I think Steph will win a game for the Celts in the, in the playoffs at some stage. Only one, maybe, but I think, I think he'll... Uh... What? <laughs> what? We're not supposed to talk about Steph. It's like a no-hitter. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I don't want to talk about him. No, change the subject. <laughs> No, oh my not, God. You, is that because you're buying into that theory? So I think he might. I think he has a surprise game in him. One, have you, saying, one game. I'm not saying you know finals. I think MVP. he's got a surprise game in him too. I just don't know what it's going to be. Oh, crap. Not, no, like and like PJ Brown last year. P, how many games did PJ Brown win, win for them? All right, the no hitter has been ruined. Let me think of all the similarities between PJ Brown and Steph. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Head hold tattoo. On. Um, uh, uh, hold on, it's coming to me. Wow. Hold on. No, I'll have to get back to you. No, I see. I backed Steiny Mo, I, and since the no hitter's been ruined, I'm just going to come out and say it. He's been unbelievable the last three weeks. He's 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 gone up a level and gives the Celtics something that they just didn't have last year. He's actually creating wide open shots consistently for teammates. All right. All right. Um, I don't whether he'll do it in the playoffs. I don't know, but he has become a massive X factor, a massive X factor. And, uh, and so really, me, so so Steph was your answer, but you just didn't want to say it. No, because I still think Odom, the Lakers win the title if they get a good playoffs. Yeah, I mean, I still remember how good he was in the first six. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Lakers. Are you talking years. about Andrew Bynum or are you talking about Greg Odom? No, I said I said Lamar Odom. I think he's. Oh, Odom. I got Odom. You. Okay. Odom. Got uh, you. Bynum, you know, Bynum. I think in a weird way, the knee injury restored the natural order of that team because they were always better off with him as the backup center and their best five is Gasol and Odom. Andrew Bynum is not in their best five. So it kind of, it kind of restored what always should have been the case. You know what I mean? I, I, Odom, I, I Odom's know. number two on my six man ballot. I know he started a bunch of games, but he still came off the bench more than he started. And, you know, when their bench was good in the beginning of the season, when, all, when the whole world was saying how great their bench was, I mean, he was the trigger man for that. I, mean, he, I would agree. He's had I would a agree with that, quiet, but I think that's – He's had a non-stat good year. Few that's care, why they're better with him coming off the bench. Few, here's why I say that. If, to me, watching them – and I, I, I think they've been pretty entertaining this year, and I love – I just think Kobe's – it's been a world-class performance by him. But um, when it, it seemed like they're always trying to acclimate Bynum. When he's in there, everybody's you know kind of tailoring their game to what he's doing. But when right. it's when it's the Odom Gasol combo, they just they flow together. They just look better. They all from an all on the same standpoint. Page. From an offensive standpoint, I'd agree with you. But defensively, Bynum, when when you if, when they can have Bynum and Ariza on the floor at the same time, they are just they are so much better defensively. Those guys are. Uh, that's a team where they can defend. And Kobe can go. Kobe and Gasol can go get what you need offensively. And to me, as a playoff team, that that works infinitely better. I agree with you offensively. They're 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 scary. But that's why I like Odom coming off the bench, triggering that 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 second unit, so that they can they can run on people. They can push the the tempo against the second unit of the other team. But here's my counter. I don't think he plays as well off the bench. I think he likes being out there. I think he's one of those guys that is just better as a starter. I think, with, based on 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 Steiny Mo's uh, six man vote, that he would disagree with you. Do you disagree, Steiny Mo? I mean, there's no question. I mean, he's, he, you know, his number. I mean, his sheer production is down. I mean, way down. Yeah. But I'm not so sure with all the time Bynum's missed that we won't see plenty of Odom with the main unit when it's crunch time. I mean, we will. you know. So, what do you guys think of the theory that? They kind of buried Odom's minutes the first two months to keep his price tag down for the summer. I thought that was interesting. I'm not buying that for a second. All right. I, you know I love conspiracy theories. Hey, I think Phil. I think Phil. Phil's desire to break his tie with Red. Kobe's. I mean, I, I just. If 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 Kobe had a sense of that, I think Odom's value would have gone up. I do too. I mean, the way he's accepted it, and you know, he didn't accept it at first, and everybody knew he didn't accept it at first, but the way he's you know, basically taking this on and been effective as a starter or a bench guy. I mean, I, I ironically, the perfect team for him on paper would be Buke's uh, team that shall not be named. But 
from everything we know about Odom, the dude likes living on the beach. <laughs> he's, not, he's signing in yeah, Miami or Los and, Angeles. And, and, you know, I don't know that I would, I would want Lamar Odom to be my oldest, most experienced player in the locker room. Oh, come on. <laughs> I, I, no, no, he is a nice guy, but did Odom I, come I up when you guys were at the strip club? <laughs> I don't want him. I don't want him setting uh, setting the tempo for uh, for work ethic or focus or or any of those things. You know, I gotta say, Buke mentioned that Trevor Reese is potentially the X factor. Not enough has been made made about how terrible that trade was by Orlando. It is arguably yeah. one of the one of the ten worst trades that nobody talks about of this decade yeah. where yeah. they basically they traded it. this guy for Brian Cook and Maurice Evans and he's 20 yep. he was 22 when they traded him yep well obviously Terrible. Orlando's defense is so good they didn't need him well uh, look, you, I mean you could go back and you look at uh, how he ended up in Orlando yeah that was the uh, that was the was trade that wasn't was, it yeah. yeah I will say though in terms of being an X factor I, I just don't think he's a good three point shooter. The numbers, you know, he's like at like three three twenty. No, he's not. For the no, event. he's not. He's not. It's, but as a but as a slasher, and defensively, his his length and his willingness to play at that end, uh, especially with Derek Fisher being challenged as 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 good as he was, as committed as he was, as much of a three point threat as he is. Uh, I think I, I I believe that they need a reason to be a factor if they're going to win a championship. I mean, long guys like that who can guard points are just priceless. I mean, I, I remember being in San Antonio in January, and the Lakers threw a Reza on Parker. Tony did not yep. like it. No. I mean, that is a valuable thing to have. I am with you on that, but when here would be my counter. So you put him in the lineup. You have one guy who's who's a bad three point shooter at a position where you need somebody to make threes. Now you have their point guards, Farmer and Fisher, who have been in a slump now for two months, like very quietly have just been playing horrendous. And yeah. if they don't get anything out of those guys and they're not getting anything out of Ariza and Odom's not really a three-point shooter, it becomes an easier team to defend, you know, at the end no, of the game. No, I, I, I agree. But, you, you, I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to need Fisher or Farmer to be making shots, uh, whether Ariza is playing or not. You, yeah. You, you're going to have to have somebody. That's, I mean, that that is. And quietly, Fish has, that's Fish has a couple team. rounds to get the groove. I mean, again, you know, I maybe no. maybe I overvalue it, but I just playoff experience. I just think it matters, and I just think he's been out there so many times that you know, yes, he's been in a slump, but who's to say these shots won't start going in for him when the, when the money's on the table? Yeah, but have you have you actually looked at how bad his stats are? Yeah, I know it's bad. I mean, he's he, this goes beyond a slump. Like this looks like somebody that might be on his way out of the league. And then you look at Farmer hasn't done much better. Everybody, have, everybody out of here is like, what's wrong with the Lakers? You know, they don't have that same killer intensity. Now their point guards stink. That's why. I mean, they've been, they've been played yeah. terrible since February, and that's why they're not playing as well. Um, no. Now if they go into a round two series against, let's say New Orleans, I don't know how the number. You know, maybe they can't even potentially play them, but. Or uh, I don't know any any good point guard. Say let's say they play Parker in round two. Parker's killing those guys on one end. They're throwing up bricks on the other end. Could get interesting. I don't. I think there are some chinks in the LA armor, but I think that the West is so bad that there's they, no uh, one to expose it. I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that's the thing. That's the thing. All right, last we, thing. Last that, thing. We we how, we've only been going what? How, we haven't even been. Uh, I thought we were going two hours today. We no, got an you, hour fifteen, and I got to go do some more TV. So we're you just got to do TV. Uh, well, Steinimo, Steinimo already gave us his tidbit that you never got in his column. Buke, what tidbit do you have for the BS Report listeners? <sighs> they know you're sticking me. You're sticking me with this. What do Don't I choke. have? Don't choke like I did and get a eight month suspension out of it. You must have wow. gotten something you know from what? Presty. What did I, um, so while, Buke, while Buke's thinking of that, so so when are we going to get into it? Because I, you know, I want to I want to participate in what is now the greatest tool for college journalism students in history, which is the Bill Simmons podcast series, where you interview Klosterman and Rick Riley and talk about the writing game. When when are we going to do one of those? Oh yeah, crap! I you know, well, t- tell the thing you were going to say, Steiny Mo, because I thought that was good. Uh, Tell well, your make your point about because I had. Um, oh no, just 
What, with about beat writers? Yeah, because we're talking about we're, you and I were exchanging some emails. Well, I think about you've been I think you've been kind of murderous on you know beat writers squandering access and all that stuff. And uh, you know, without trying to toot my horn that much, I mean, I think the beat writers were a lot more veteran. You know, ten, twelve, twenty years ago, that with the you know the, the whole flood of you know, guys like us who have come to ESPN and you've got so many newspaper guys who've left newspapers to go to the multimedia outlets. So I would say that the experience factor of beat writers has to be factored into it too. So you're saying what were once upon a time beat writers were almost overqualified for what they were doing. TV and the Internet has ruined that, and now you have people that are thrust into the job, that don't have the years of experience and networking, all that stuff. Well, as much as this pains me to admit publicly – in 1997, when I was fortunate enough to get the Dallas Mavericks beat for the Dallas Morning News, I was not their first choice. Their first choice was a finely coiffed, well-tanned surfer <laughs> from Cincinnati who turned down the job. Wow. And then they settled for me. Holy mackerel. I didn't uh, know that. I, 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 one, I think one of the biggest issues is that beat writers don't matter like they once did. Yeah. They were once the 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 – the the journalistic face of a franchise, you had to deal with your beat writer. The beat writer was around all the time, and he was the one who set the public opinion on on how your team was viewed. I just I, I believe a lot of that uh, influence and power has been lost, and so as a result, teams have a much easier time of stonewalling or not dealing uh, with their beat guys, and uh, and, and as a result. The, the I don't know whether it's the qual I don't know that the quality of the the guy in the position as much as uh, I don't know that it's quality. quality I just mean experience. You know, like I, I mean, I got my first NBA beat writing job at 24. I was able to cover the Clippers, which you know, it's a beat that not a lot of people are paying attention to. I got to learn the game, meet a lot of people, and it's just a different world now. Where so you know, all of us who do this, you know, whether it's Buke or Broussard or me or Adrian Woj and Johnny Ludden at Yahoo or Aldrich at TNT. I mean, all of us, we were all beat writers. I mean, and all those guys have now, you know, left that world to go to this world. So it's just, I just think that's changed it. You know, one of, one of the other things that's torn at the, at, at the influence of, of the beat writer is the fact that we have this immediacy and you have, you have blogs and you have various internet sites and, there are bits and pieces of information that are put out there. Again, you know, every some day of it's now. Accurate, yeah, and it's out and every day, and some of it's accurate and some of it's not. And nobody's can, nobody's keeping track of how much the non-mainstream uh, journalists get wrong. What their batting average is. It, it, all that matters is the times that they get it, they get something even just half right. And so now that that view of a beat writer who, by and large, up until just a couple of years ago, still they, you know still wasn't using the internet. You still had to wait until the next morning to get their report. They were fighting a losing battle. It, it, it almost looked as if, hey, wait a minute, I read this online last night, and uh, this guy's still not giving me as much in, information the next morning. He's, he's fighting a losing battle because he's got to go through more checks and balances to report something. And and he's doing it later, and so the feeling is, well, is this guy really on top of it? When when the fact of the matter remains, that beat guys who are out there every day watching every game know so much more than anybody who's watching on TV or is following any other report. And but I don't know that that's that's recognized the way. And always, always one of the always. hardest things is knowing more than you can write and knowing when you Absolutely. can go with it. I mean, that's the worst Absolutely. feeling in the world when you know something, but you can't write it and you got to wait for your chance. So Absolutely. I, and by the what, way, my, my little scoop, I'll give you a little scoop. Uh, Eric Snow will be the new face of China for, uh, for the NBA in China. He's going to become one of their, their premier executives. He's being groomed for that. How's that? Blockbuster, better ball hoops hype. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> Do you do you guys potentially see? I have to go. Oh, go! All right. Well, I'll finish with Steinemo. Thank you, Rick. You Buker. know what? You guys started without me. You can finish without me. Thank you, Rick Buecher. Always, Sat, always sad to get my run now. Get my PT Let's, now. Let's do it before the finals. <laughs> All right. Thank Later. you.
Um, yeah, that's in, he made an interesting point about about uh, how beat writers they used to matter more, or one of you did. Beat writers used to matter more, and now you don't. Because I remember growing up with Bob Ryan, the seventies and eighties. He was a beat writer. Nowadays, he would have gone to TV in like nineteen seventy eight. You know, yep. and it would have been the intern would have started covering. Hey, I have a ton of sympathy for these guys. There is a there is so much more media covering this stuff. So much, you know, the national media back in the day was, you know, it was Vessi really. I mean, was there wasn't a national media really beyond him, and even he was mostly at a paper just focusing on national stuff. But you know, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Ryan was a beat writer most of that time, wasn't he? I mean, he he was. You know, so you can't you can cover the league and still do you know those epic Sunday notes packages, but, you know, your team covering the team is the priority. So, you know, now there are so many, you know, guys who do what, what Buke and I do, who are just covering the league for a national outlet. There's just so much more competition. Just, just, I notice it now, like when I go to a practice and there's just so many more people there, you get so, you just get less and less one-on-one time with these guys. Your, you know, the court access has changed. I mean, in a lot of ways, it, it's harder to get that, stuff that you're talking about, you know, that incredible, you know, access. But, I mean, it does, you know, it's not, I'm not giving them a blanket excuse. I mean, you're right. If you're with the team every day, you should be getting nuggets that nobody else has. And, you know, well, but, like, uh, but there's a track record of, of people that have done it successfully in mixed blogging and my font's going off. People who have mixed how to blog, how to write game stories, how to give me inside locker room stuff that I cannot get from anywhere else. And that was why I wrote that thing in the first place, because there are guys who are doing that. Right. Guys that I have bookmarked, guys that I like reading. And it, it, I just think if that's your job, I feel like that's how you should cover the team. I want st- I want the stuff from the locker room. Right. You and I agree with you. You have access that I don't have. You know? I just think, in you know, again, you probably can't throw a blanket over it and say this is totally the way it is. But I think in a lot of cases we've seen that because – Newspaper staff have, have been reduced, and so many guys are getting let go, and a lot of times it's veteran guys getting let go because they're the ones who make more. Just, you know, in some cases, beats are going to people that, you know, when we were kids or coming up would have had no chance. Right. I mean, I got a beat at 24 because I was working for the worst-paying paper of, 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 with a 200,000 circulation in the country. And the, the LA Daily News had a lot of great people come through there, but they always left. I mean, they always went on to something bigger that paid more. So I was able, you know, as a punk kid, to get a chance to cover the Clippers. And at the time, I think I was probably, you know, the youngest writer in the league got to travel. And that was just total luck for me. It was just like a, you know, it was like winning the lottery that I was able to travel with an NBA team at that that age. And but now, you know, I think those opportunities come up more and more because of the state of newspapers and, and maybe people are getting these jobs, you know, and they don't even have, you know, NBA experience before they do it. And, you know, but in the seventies, that seemed to happen a lot. Like I remember Mike Lupica left the, you know, graduated from, I think he went to BC and was covering the Celtics. That was his first job. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm now the beat writer of the Boston Celtics. And now I think it's kind of swinging back that way because newspapers are understaffed because a lot of people are jumping the internet TV. Like, the Red Sox have a beat writer who's really good, whose name is, uh, I think her name is Emily Benjamin. She can't be older than like 25. She does a good job, though. And she's somebody that was like an intern a year ago. And right. I don't think 10 years ago that's not happening. No, I, I, I mean, I've heard you talk about, you know, you, how you felt coming out when you came out of college and you just felt like there was no hope. I mean, you know, I don't want to say make it sound like, you know, I felt the exact same way, but I certainly understand that there are a lot of people who you just felt like, wow, I mean, the path to getting on to, you know, covering, you know, I mean, just even for me, like in those days, the LA Times would never hire someone from the LA Daily News. That barrier has since been broken tenfold. But I mean, when I was in college, I mean, it was just like I worked at the Orange County Register in college. I worked at the LA Daily News as my first full-time job out of college. But it was like, there was no way the Times was ever going to hire me. That's just how it felt at the time, no matter what I did. So the playoffs start this weekend. As always, you will be rooting for your Dallas Mavericks because that means less travel for Steiny Mo if Dallas is in the playoffs. Well, admit it. I mean, that wouldn't be the reason I'm. I mean, I think it's you know my shameless love for Dirk's probably the reason more than the travel. I, I don't mind travel. I like. Uh, I want to. I mean, that'll that'll be the one thing that's nice actually is places like Portland and Denver that. I haven't had a reason to go too much in recent years. You know, maybe I'll get to hit hit those cities now because I do th- I I do think like you were saying, 
Portland is kind of a team we're all watching. I mean, they're, we're all counting on them to make this interesting in the West. So I definitely do want to get up there and see what that crowd is like. Because I just, you know, again, I, I see this in, uh, in soccer all the time where, you know, the pressure you feel from the home fans that, that, mm. that want it all and aren't getting it. I just wonder if that's going to be an issue. Hey, I mean, you have Portland in the West and Miami in the East. Those are some two pretty fun underdogs potentially in round one. Oh, round Miami's two. beating Atlanta, right? Wade's not losing that series. Usually the best player on the, on the floor thing trumps everything. I got to say the one thing with Atlanta is Al Horford's finally given them something. He was, like, he, he was kind of like not – he wasn't where I thought he'd be this year, put it that way. He was there defensively, not offensively, and I think the last few weeks I've seen a little something extra from him. And that makes that makes me wonder if they're maybe yeah, but they need Marvin Williams. Williams to be right to guard Wade. True, and True. I don't think he's going to be there. He's not going to be where they need him to be. The best player in the team, the best player in the series, is almost always going to win the series. Hey, last thing, because I forgot to mention this: What do you think is going to happen with Nash? I think they are going to make a pretty good offer to him. And I think he's going to give it serious consideration. I mean, the guy's 35. If you've got an extension offer, I think the most likely scenario still is that he stays. But I also have a feeling that the Suns are going to get some pretty good trade offers because I think a lot of teams out there would love to bring Nash in at this stage of his career to kind of show them the way. I'm going to step on. If you're the Suns. You know, he's, he's the guy you can get the most for at this point. If you're going to, I mean, they'll move, they're going to try to move Shaq for sure. But if, if they were willing to trade Nash, I mean, they could get some, some pretty interesting stuff. I'm going to step on another paragraph in, in my MVP column. You're going to do what? I'm going to step on one more paragraph from the column. Oh, okay. I don't think there's any conceivable way they can keep him because they're already at 49 million just with Amari, Shaq, and Jason Richardson. All of whom are untradeable. And Amari, I think, is untradeable because the, I think nobody really knows. That I agree is. with you. I don't know that Shaq is untradeable yet. I think Shaq's untradeable. We Cleveland loses the finals. They don't, have, they don't revisit their Shaq interest. Well, I, you know, for, I know Shaq put up stats, but I don't know how effective he was. And, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that that team missed the playoffs. I don't, no question, know, but I think, it would be diff- I think it would be different in Cleveland. I think, I think getting with LeBron – would be different for Shaq. I think uh, it's easier for him to slide into the number two slot there because LeBron is LeBron. And I'm not ready to rule that one out. Now, again, if Cleveland wins it all, then, you know, no. But if Cleveland loses to yourselves in the East Finals? Yeah, you mean a panic trade. I don't know. I think they can do better. Is it a panic trade for one year? You're taking on, they probably just trade Ben Ben Wallace. Wallace for Shaq. I mean, you know, Ben Wallace and whatever for Shaq. Mm. I don't know if I'd do it. I, I know his stats were there, but I didn't love the way he played. Um, well, regardless, so that's $49 million. The tax is going backwards. The cap's going backwards. They they basically have $69 million tied up next year in five guys, including Barbosa and Nash. So either keep Nash or give away Barbosa. Just say, here, take him. Those are their two options to get under the tax because I'm not even including the rest of the guys. Well, let me – I'll put it this – I mean, look, if, this, if they can't make any other changes and they're just coming back with the same team, yeah, then, then you know, the possibility of trading Nash goes up because it's the only change they can make, and they definitely don't want to go through this – what they went through this year and do it again last year. But, you know, I think – you know, we'll see. We'll see if, you know, if they can move Shaq or not. I mean, that, that will really – that would really tell us, but I mean, I think their you know, A scenario or their dream scenario is try to move Shaq and convince Nash to stay. And I, I give that a fair chance of happening. I'm sure their dream scenario is moving Shaq. It would be mine too. <laughs> I just don't think it's going to happen. I, you're talking now about a guy who this will be his 18th year pay, with a cap figure of $20 million. And in a league where the cap's going backwards, everybody is losing money, season ticket sales are way down, they have no idea what the economic climate's going to be, why is somebody going to take his salary on? I just don't see it. I don't think anybody is making a move like that. In fact, I think it's going to go the other way. I think, I think teams are going to actually be giving away. I think, like, for instance, I could totally see Phoenix saying, here, Sam Presti, we're going to give you Leandro Barbosa. Here, take him. 
Just give us no back one of your crappy there, first round. The picks. quote I keep hearing from more than one team: twenty-five teams will be dumping. You know, the other three, four, maybe five will be buyers. No yeah. question. This next season, I think, is. You're going to get your trades that you you complained about in February. You're going to get my trades, but not in a good way. I, I really worry about the quality of the no, league. No, and, and you know when I had a, I had a chance to talk when I did my thing with Stern, uh, you know, a, a few weeks ago when I kind of wrote the the uh, the follow up to your piece for, from All Star Weekend, and I I asked him, I said, don't we need to get back to making basketball trades? No yeah. trade, it, not a single trade that's made anymore is a basketball trade. But you know he would not agree with me and 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 see that. The path that we've gone down is so bad, but I, I mean, I'm I'm with you. I mean, it's just no. It's, they know. They they totally. Know. Oh, they have to know. I mean, and the issue is that you know they never envisioned a scenario where the cap would go backwards. And as we both wrote, when the cap, you know, they they didn't have anything built in that the player salaries would decrease if the cap decreased. So this is a worst case scenario in two counts because you have salaries going up, but the cap going the other way, and then you have this luxury tax, which. Now I think we can all agree the luxury tax, not a good thing. You know, I think it was put in place to basically prohibit teams like Portland and the Knicks from just outspending everybody. But nobody's doing that now. And now it's basically just penalizing all these teams for trying to get 10% better than they are. It's a bad thing. Well, I'm just hoping that this whole spirit of cooperation is real and these guys realize what's at stake and over the next 18 months or whatever it is, figure this out because – you and I have talked about this through email. I know you have no faith that that's No happen. faith. I don't but. trust agents. Agents have never done the right thing, ever. They always look out for themselves. They always look out for money. They never yeah, but, sacrifice. You know, when, they, when, when, they, when, when, it, when, when people start to believe what this handful of you know, ownership-type people are saying about how there, there are so many teams hurting that they would, they would be you know, financially easier for them not to have a season, when, when that starts to sink in more, they, you know, guys are going to come to their. You'd like to think they're going to come to their senses and say, "Well, you know, four percent of less is better than nothing." It all sounds fine and dandy until they actually have these guys in the room and they're going to tell them, "Yeah, you're not going to make as much money anymore." Well, this is the first time. I mean, this is not the first time that the NBA has faced dire consequences. And I mean, let, there's only been one lockout, so you know. Well, my whole thing is, as I wrote, I, I think this needs to happen. They, it almost, it's almost a cleansing. Of sorts, they need to have this lockout to restore the natural order of the way the league should be, and I just don't see the two sides agreeing. Like you look at how contentious it was ten years ago, and and just how unwilling the players were to even see the big picture. I know this is a, a smarter generation of guys that ha- that are, are better characters for the most part. I don't see them making that leap. And I, you know, but I do believe now. Again, is this just stuff they're telling me because my tape recorder's on? I mean, yeah, yes. you, could, you could wonder that. But I've yet to have a conversation with a player who, who, who just says, "No way, we're not giving anything back." I mean, I think they see it. I think they see that in every industry in the world, people are either losing their jobs or, or taking pay cuts. I mean, I, I, you know, I think. You're crazy. They don't see it. Do you think these guys even know what's going on? Uh, I, I, Come I on. Do. I mean. I, I, I think maybe some of the older guys do. Well, those are probably the ones I'm asking. But you think like you've seen these guys get off get off the bus from the airplane, going to their hotel, going to the luxury suite. They have their iPods on. They're texting people. They're not. They're not reading the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, but this summer is going to awaken a lot of people when nobody gets money. Mm. When even good free agents are going to be scrounging for less than the mid level. You know what though? We say that now, and I and I. I feel like I could still see like one or two te- teams doing something dumb, and then every everybody can just point to that you know that one bad contract. Like for instance, last year it was Corey Maggette. Oh yeah, Corey Maggette got fifty million. I'm worth fifty million. All it takes is one bad contract to screw everything up, screw up the order of what guys should be worth. Well, the only counter there is I don't know who's going to give that. Con- I mean, there are only about five teams that have the money. Well, it's, it's it's a question of who's desperate, right? And 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 look, Memphis is not spending. Atlanta has convinced no one that they're ready to spend. Detroit can spend, but I'm you know they're prudent. If, if Boozer doesn't opt out, you know you would think they're probably going to try to go the trade route to fill that space. Yeah, I mean there just isn't a lot of money flying. I mean, 
it's not, not like not 2010, it's not like 2010 when there will be a bunch of teams with money, and yes, somebody will do something stupid because they didn't get one of the main free agents. But that's the thing. If they don't settle this this summer, and I don't think they will, then you look at what's going to happen next summer, and uh, again, only takes two or three really dumb contracts, and it's going to convince these guys, oh yeah, no, we don't need to sacrifice. Look at what so-and-so got. And that's, you know, we, we're still looking at 2011 here, not next year. It's We're a couple of years away, so... Well, one thing I'm banking on, and maybe I shouldn't, maybe I'm being naive here because, I mean, you know, finances and, and you know, these owners are going to listen to their accountants more than they're going to listen to the commissioner. But I, I just think Stern is coming to the end of his reign. His legacy is important to him. <laughs> so they they've claim. Had, they've, they've had some pretty rough seas here in the last few years with Donaghy and the brawls and whatever. He's going to find a way to make it work. That's, that's, you know, when you ask me what am I banking on, I'm banking on him to broke or something. I mean, that's... <laughs> Maybe I'm putting too much on him, but I mentioned to somebody that maybe it's the end of the stern reign, and uh, somebody who's kind of in the in the circles. And uh, the guy predicted that not only is it not the end of the stern reign, or, or even getting nearly close, but that Stern is going to end up being like one of those 92 year old senators that you see on Capitol Hill trying to speak and like is all hunched over and can barely. And you're like, wow, how is that guy still an elected official? That's the point Stern will get before they somehow figure out a way to – like they, this guy think – the feeling is that Stern has another 15 years in him, as amazing as that sounds. Well, I mean, on he one hand – He loves the NBA. It, this is I all mean, he it, cares about. It doesn't sound unplaus- or non-plausible or whatever the word is because who's, you know, who's going to take his place? I mean, we still – Nobody. You know, we, I mean, there, there just is still not a clear-cut successor to this throne – he will but sniff no out. No matter whether that's true or not, I just cannot believe he's gonna he's gonna let the you know LeBron, let's just say hypothetically LeBron whether LeBron goes to the Knicks or stays with the Cavs after that epic summer he's gonna find a way that a year later this league's not sh- shutting down. Mm. Or maybe he doesn't want to find a way. Maybe he wants it to shut down. <laughs> da, da, da. Conspiracy Possible. theory shock shock ending. <laughs> Unless you want to go. We're done. We're not gonna go another couple hours. No, we're gonna split this into two parts though. So it'd be good. It'd be a two-parter. It'd be like uh, your first appearance in a two-parter of anything, I think, right? A comeback. Yeah, come back. Comeback podcaster of the year. Welcome back from your suspension, Mark Stein. We read you on ESPN.com. We look forward to your uh, weekend dime this weekend. I'm sure you have some good things in store for us. And uh, talk to you during the playoffs. Sounds good. Thanks. Before I get the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Two months. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.